poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is a legend of the game who has experienced the evolution and transformation of the poker world firsthand over the past 40 years, the indomitable Jan Fisher. I'm not going to lie to you, this is a hard intro for me to do because the following conversation shifted the paradigm in which I view the legends of poker in the 70s and 80s. As it turns out, most of the folks I idolized as an 18-year-old kid aspiring to be a professional poker player were unimaginably abusive to both dealers and their fellow poker players. It's simultaneously a bizarre and sobering thought to imagine my personal heroes of poker chucking cards at dealers and cursing them out because they had the audacity to deal out a bad river card, but that's a reality Jan lived through and experienced firsthand as both a dealer and player in her poker journey. It begs an important question. How much goodwill and forgiveness ought to be given to human beings simply because they're a unique and transcendent talent? It's a question that quite frankly makes me sad to even ask. I believe it's easy for us as humans to have infinite grace because of raw talent when we weren't the ones who actually experienced the pain and suffering caused by the abuse. Ultimately, I believe this question can only be answered honestly by the folks who have paid the physical and emotional price. The souls who live with the scars of nightly mistreatment for years on end by the very folks we call our heroes. If you're one of these humans and would like to tell your side of the story, please feel free to email me at brad at chasingpokergreatness.com. Now, without any further ado, I'm proud to bring to you a human being blessed with supernatural strength, endurance, and resolve, a woman who transformed the game of poker from the inside out and didn't stand for any disrespectful nonsense, the one and only Jan Fisher. Jan, welcome to Chasing Poker Greatness. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. And hat tip to Linda Johnson for making the connection. And um, at the beginning of these shows, I, I tend to want to know your story. Uh, what does your story entering the poker world look like? Um, wow. I, I used to come to Las Vegas with my mother. My mom took junkets and so she was a comp guest and I'd go with her and we go to the shows and all the fancy meals and I really loved it and I was 17 18 when I started coming down here and then I kind of wandered into a poker room one day and thought man this is something I could do and I started I played poker from when I was a kid and uh, I found out that poker dealers didn't split their tips and I knew I could be the kind of dealer I would wish that there was in the game so I moved here to shortly after I turned 21. I dealt poker most of the first 10 or 12 years I lived in town, um, made the crossover to being a winning player, which of course is a little bit nicer than dealing, but I got to have all that fun back in the seventies and eighties when, you know, when there were no rules and it was an old boys club and they, there were literally no rules. So, um, let's, uh, let's go back. Let's go back to your mom getting flown to Vegas. Uh, what year was this? Oh, when I use you're trying to do this to find out how old I am. I <laughs> well, we, we have to set the timeline. Yeah, yeah no, it was probably, <laughs> it was probably in beginning in 73 or 74. And then I moved to Las Vegas in 77. What, what'd your mom do? What was Vegas like back in the seventies? Well, she happened to be a very good blackjack player. She knew perfect basic strategy. And she knew that if she just bet $5 every time win or lose at the end of the, of the junket, she wouldn't be winning much. She wouldn't be losing much. And she learned that she could get all kinds of free, cool stuff by not really risking anything and yet playing by the rules. And so that was kind of how I got introduced to it. We got to go on the invited guest line. I mean, it was just whatever we wanted, we could have. And mind you, she was a $5 better. It wasn't like she was a whale. Yeah. Um, how did your mom 
get a hold of basic blackjack strategy. And you mentioned that you played cards growing up. So I'm I'm assuming before you flew out to Vegas, you had a positive relationship with playing cards. Absolutely. And p- poker was my friend even back then. Um, yeah, a, a family friend had taught me to play poker when I was probably eight or nine years old, only it was called Paul's Game. And I didn't know what Paul's Game really was, but I knew that if these cards looked like that, that I'd get a piece of candy. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty good stuff. And so later on in life, I found out that Paul's game really was poker. And so I was ahead of the curve. I already knew the ranking of the hands. I knew what the whole function was. And my dad had a, had a poker game at, at, uh, in the building where we lived. And so I was around poker a lot when I was a kid. And it just seemed like something I'd be happy doing. And I've been doing it since 77. And what was it about Vegas that got its hooks into you? in the 70s that made you want to stay the sun i lived in (laughs) seattle i lived in seattle i I ride a motorcycle and i coming down here with my mom all those times it was like oh my god it's always sunny sky is always blue it's hotter than hot but you know what it's not raining and so i i couldn't wait to move down here i my heart is still in seattle when i go up to do the alaska cruise or whatever. I always spend at least a week in Seattle seeing all my old friends and all my old haunts, but uh, Las Vegas is my home, but my heart is in Seattle. And what were your, what were you doing in life? You know, when you moved to Vegas to be a dealer, what was your aspirations? What were you thinking about uh, spending your, your time pursuing? I didn't really have too many aspirations. I aimed low and, uh, but I was, I was working for Eddie Bauer in Seattle. And I was a teamster, so I was getting pretty good wages, but it was a job that that I knew I couldn't do for very long because it was too heavy, too much lifting. And I'm realizing now, 40 some years later, that I probably shouldn't have done it as much as I did because my body is kind of wrecked. But I didn't, I, I hadn't, hadn't yet completed my college. I'd been one year of college and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I was just flitting around, but somehow poker, Dealing poker got its hooks in me, and I knew that I should come down here, and that's what I should do. I came down to drop my car down. I had twelve hundred dollars, and that that was it. And the rest is history. And you, you mentioned no rules, anything goes. So I need to press on that. W- what do you mean by no rules, anything goes? Wow. Oh my God, I could tell you stories that that will just. Um, well, this is the place. Have, this is actually the perfect place. To especially because you're not even getting the, the video. <laughs> um, all right. So here, th- these are just some things that I know that happened to other dealers. I had a friend um, who was dealing and a player in the one seat urinated on her under the table. That was, you know, kind of a no rules. Everything goes. Jesus. I have another friend who had a cigarette put out on the back of her arm because she didn't push the pot quick enough or, or something like that. I mean, there was just so many horrible things. I, I, for the most part, lost every job I've had because I wouldn't take the crap. And Las Vegas being a, a fire at will city, uh, it's put change in personnel on your slip and you go off and look for another job the next day. But I wasn't, I wasn't going to take that crap and I wasn't going to be in the, in, in the industry long enough to see, to see that catch up to me. I, you know, being called the C word was nothing unusual. Um, I was uh, one time when I was dealing at the Nugget, I had a, a very prominent player who actually just died. I didn't shed a tear. Um, he playing a 10 and 20 limit hold'em game. He said to me, I hope your mother gets cancer and dies. Now, wow. have you ever thought about saying that to someone? Did that just like roll off your tongue? I mean, this had to be preconceived. I mean, this and, and my mom happened to be sick at the time, so it had a little extra sting to it. But so that, you know, there are just more and more stories like that, getting hit with cards, having cards thrown at you, you know, being hit in the arm, being hit in the back. I mean, it's it was it was really ugly back then. And I'm guessing no floor protected the dealers at all. Correct. They you could call the floor and they'd come over and kind of appease everybody, but they'd really just tell the player, look, she'll be pushed out of the game in 12 minutes or whatever. Just try not to throw the cards or, or call her the C word, you know, until she gets out. Because, you know, they were all getting tips. So, they, you know, and I understand that you got to, you know, I don't know where your bread is buttered, but it was ugly. It was ugly, Brad. And how'd you, how did you reconcile that? Being someone that's not going to take that kind of shit 
Um, I, I got fired because I, I, I had I had one job actually where I walked out in the middle of the hand. I just put the deck down, capped it off, and I said, you know, no, I don't have to deal him. And I walked out in the middle of the hand, and I thought for sure when I came in the next day, since I didn't get a phone call saying I'd been replaced, that I'd come in the next day and not have a time card. Well, I did have a time card. I came into the card room. I still had a, a, a position to go in the draw. And I was working for, Ed, for uh, Eric Drake at the time at the Golden Nugget. And then he came in the card room and I thought, well, here's where I get it. Because I just couldn't believe I hadn't been fired yet. He took me over to an empty black table, black deck table, said, let's sit down and chat for a minute. He says, I hear there was a little activity last night. And I said, well, yeah, pretty much. And he related the story that he heard. He said, is that what happened? I said, yeah, that's pretty much what happened. And he patted me on the back and said, that's great. He said, now go get to work. Because, you know, he knew that the guy had thrown cards at me one time too many, and I wasn't going to take anymore. And he he was okay with that. And, you know, that's about when things started getting a little bit better for dealers and players as far as the behavior in card rooms. Back, back in the day in the 70s and 80s, I would not have wanted my mom in a card room. It's just, you know, it really was a men's domain. And, you know, historically speaking, the, the men's behavior, for the most part, is not as good as women's behavior in a poker room. And maybe that's because we're late to the game. I don't know. Well, in many rooms, probably that, that could be said <laughs> about men's men's behavior being worse than women's. <laughs> um, so in the 70s, in the 80s, dealing, dealing, um, I mean, taking all that abuse, did you ever have thoughts of like, yeah, I'm just done with this, done with this Vegas thing, done with this dealing thing? I never felt like I was done with the Vegas thing, but I, I did know that I was done dealing poker because I just couldn't have the uncertainty of knowing if I was going to be walking out of work that night and was going to have a job the next night. Um, and so I never never thought about leaving poker. I just figured I had to learn how to play a little better, and and I did. And then I supported myself playing for a couple of years and then got my got my coals in a couple of different irons. And uh, I yeah. just the irons in the coal, but whatever. <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> Whichever we, it is. I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> um, tell me about Vegas and dealing cards and being around in that world when, you know, it wasn't abusive in the 70s and the 80s. The characters, you know, this is something that... I got into the poker world in like 2004 and you read the stories of, you know, Stewie Unger and Doyle and Chip and all of those guys. Um, what was that? What was that like in your experience? Um, it, it, there were so many of the players you just named and then some uh, during the World Series of Poker, which would be at Bing and Horseshoe right across the street from the Nugget. Uh, we had a lot of play back and forth. We also had a tournament called the... the I think it was the Grand Prix of Poker, which was a tournament series at the Golden Nugget. And that's where I got to meet a lot, a lot of these players. And, you know, everybody has these guys up for hero wealth, for a hero worship. And most of them I wouldn't even invite it in my home, you know, they're, they're, because the behavior is so bad. Um, but it, it, and most, m many of the well known players are some of the worst offenders. Not all of them, of course. I mean, there are some amazingly wonderful people to deal to. The majority of people are good to deal to. But the bad apples just, it just, you know, I mean, I can, I can see that I'm getting irritated right now just thinking back on it. It's crazy because you go into work, you go, you sit in the game, you had a half hour to do in that game, and you didn't know if you were going to get hit in the eye with a card. I mean, yeah. it was just that crazy. Well, that's that, that, so uh, I, I almost want to ask you off record because, you know, it, it's tough having no experience and having having not been through that right and if you're yeah. if you're creating history a record of history then people tend to put themselves in the best light as it relates to writing writing that history so maybe we can frame it in this way who are the good guys you know who who were the the people that were pleasurable to deal to that were respectful that never threw any cards that sort of thing uh, unfortunately a lot of them have passed on but um, uh, Kenny Flayton was amazing. Barry Johnston, uh, Seymour Leibowitz. I mean, God, there's so much, so many nice people in the game. And of course, I'm thinking of all the the bad guys. But mo you know, most of the really high limit players that play like in Bobby's room or Doyle's room now, um, they their behavior is kind of whatever they want to do. Because even even today, because they they're playing so high and the juice is so much. Um, 
But let, let's see, who, who else were, were the nice guys? Because there were plenty of them. There were also plenty of not nice guys, a lot of whom are now dead, which is fine with me. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let me, let me kind of think on that. That was a question I haven't thought about in a long time. It's easier to think of the bad apples, and of course, I don't want to name them. So Yeah, n- negativity bias, right? Those are yeah. the ones that, that sort of... Yeah, the squeaky wheel. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, tell me about battling in the streets as, as a woman, um, being in the arena, playing cards. How is that experience compared to dealing? It, for me, it's pretty much always been... A, a good environment because I don't take crap from anybody. I'm fairly well known in the industry and I had the background of dealing. So I, you know, I know when things are right and when they're not right. Um, and I don't know, you, you just, uh, you know, you just, you, when you, when you're playing instead of dealing, you, you have a whole different respect for things and you, you, you can respect dealers a whole lot more if you play it. A lot of people who don't play don't know how difficult a job it can be. But I don't know. I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I know when I first started playing cards, um, I got into the game because a friend of mine's mom was a dealer. And so that was, I guess, part of the game, part of the experience that I understood because I had firsthand experience in, you know, just how tough the job was and how miserable it could be if you're stuck in a box and getting abused, right? getting abused and not tipped. <laughs> yeah, the the double whammy, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, even if you are getting tipped, uh, getting abused. Yeah, you can't pay me enough to throw cards at me. So. Yeah. Uh, um, so I know that something that was near and dear to Linda Johnson's heart, who came on to Chasing Poker Greatness just a little couple weeks ago, she mentioned that cleaning up the game of poker um, and syncing up with you as you know just things that she was passionate about first cleaning up the game of poker when did y'all's relationship begin when did y'all become friends i met linda back in the 80s when i was working at the golden nugget and that was the one card room in vegas that had the sort of high limit games um and we had a 1530 stud game there and i just i remember linda being a 1530 stud player and this is back in the 80s and so often back then there might be one or two females playing in the room and not a whole lot more than that dealing in the room. And so women would kind of gravitate towards each other because, you know, women like to hang out with other women, the same as the boys like to have their boys clubs. And so we got to be friends that way. And then I I ended up, uh, I was dealing the cruises when she went as a passenger on the cruise and she was going to buy the whole company, which she did. And uh, I've been, you know, been working with her ever since and we've been we've been friends for more than for 40 years i guess and we've probably been best friends for 30 years so tell me about uh, working on the cruises because you know i I know card player cruises has been around for a while i did not realize they had been around the poker cruises had been along around for that long oh yeah yeah and in, in fact uh linda and i disagree on when the first uh first poker cruise was but um, the first poker cruise that Card Player Magazine did is is the one she's talking about, which I believe was in nineteen was in nineteen ninety or ninety one, something like that. It was, it was a long ass time ago. <laughs> but the, the nice thing about about the cruises is, is that we take the poker room with us. We we bring customers, have a Las Vegas style poker room, and they get all the benefit of everything else that's going on on the ship. Uh, you can bring your kids. You can have dinner with your your husband or wife or partner every night. Uh, do as much as or as little as you want. Come on the ship and never play poker. Just travel with people who are fun. And I know that when you got to Linda talking about the cruises, that was probably the nearest and dearest uh, topic you could have brought for her. Yes, that's the part of the card player business that she hung on to after yeah. after selling to the Shulmans. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that you had multiple irons in the fire to go along with, you know, playing cards, dealing cards. What irons did you have in the fire? Um, wow. I'm trying to think of what I was doing. I know I had, I had a couple of like, like part-time jobs that would, that would supplement stuff that, you know, nothing was ever very, very much of anything, but, you know, I cleaned up some warehouses after hours. I just, when the, when the poker got to be so untenable, 
it, it just became such an ugly environment and I was just miserable all the time. I knew I had to do something different. And I, you know, I, I was meeting a lot of people. I, you know, I was new in town in 77, but I was meeting a lot of people. There wasn't really anything else I could do at that time, even though I was trying. And so I just learned how to play better. That was, that was my, ma my major goal. Yeah. And then once you found success, you're making money, you're doing well. Uh, what happened? What, what was the next move after that? Well, I wasn't really doing well. I was barely scraping by. Um, you know, I was, I was back in the day, we had seven card stud for the most part. And I, I was a seven card stud player. We played a one, three, six on the end stud game. And, you know, you could play all day and maybe eke out 80 or 100 bucks, which kind of was a lot of money back then, but not enough to, to survive on. Um, and, yeah, just, you know, dealing and playing is probably the best combination you can have, especially if you play in the card room where you work, because you get to see a lot more hands and you get to get some of your lessons for free. And that's what I started doing at the Nugget, because that's where the behavior kind of sent me from the, from the game from dealing. Uh, and just, yeah, <laughs> but I, I would get, to, you know, I'd watch these high limit games while I would deal. I wasn't just putting the tickets out. I was paying attention to the strategy they were playing, you know, and then uh, you were asking about who some of the good guys were. Bob Schifoni comes to mind. He, uh, he's written a whole lot of books and he, uh, he would be in the one or the eight seat when I'd get in these high limit games at the Nugget. First time I ever got in an Omega game, I had no idea how to do it. And he just ran it. You know, Jan, give everyone four cards, deal to the button. Now, now stop. Da -da 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 -da. All right. Burn put out the flat. And he just said it softly. And he was always there. He always helped the dealer, you know, as long as you weren't, as long as you weren't, you know, <laughs> doing something where he would rather have you just get cards thrown at you. If he liked <laughs> you, he would always help you. Um, well, lucky, lucky for you that he, he yeah. liked you. Yeah. Um, I know, again, when, when Linda bought Card Player Magazine, um, her and her associates. I can't remember who she bought uh, the magazine with. One of her goals was to call out the bad behavior yes. and stamp it out. Yep. Um, tell me, I, I guess, what that meant for you and when did you start seeing the tide shift? Well, when, when Linda had bought the magazine, um, she told the, the, the big tours, you know, like the, the World Series and, and all this, she told them that she was so tired of the, of the crap at the poker table and so tired the, of the behavior and whatnot that she was going to give them X amount of time to clean up poker's dirty little secret. And if it didn't, if it wasn't greatly improved by whatever time period, she said, she was going to write about it. And one thing, one thing about Linda is she, she's very passionate about poker um, she's very passionate about what's right and what's wrong, and she's very well respected in the industry, and, and she was back then, too. So when she told somebody, you know, either you're going to fix this or I'm going to write about it, they, they took notice. And that was the year that they started having the time penalties uh, where you have to you get like a 10-minute timeout or, you know, it's now moved to be in numbers of hands or rotations. But, um, you know, she did get it changed and, and I was dealing at the time and she saw that I wasn't going to take any crap. And it's amazing there. I'd be somebody be dealing with dealing a game and I'd be pushing in that dealer. And like the last hand, somebody would throw cards at the dealer and I'd sit in the game and everybody would be behaving because they knew I wouldn't take it. And that's that's kind of what she was was trying to get get along was that if, if if you don't fix it, she will write about it and it probably will not come out very good for the industry. It's it was a, a pretty new industry forty years ago. Did you find anyone that apologized for their behavior from the early days that kind of realized like wow things were just kind of out of line back then? Wow, that's an interesting question. And no, I don't think so. But I do know that I apologized to somebody once because I thought I was out of line. It turns out I wasn't, but it, it bothered me, you know. Um, but no, I don't think anybody did ever come back and apologize. All and right. That's, that's an I, interesting question, though. Well, I, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to to let somebody off the hook, I guess, for the the badness. You know, somebody <laughs> that that kind of learned their lesson and like, wow, like we were really treating people like shit, and that was awful of us. And you know, I'm really sorry that that you experienced that. And you know, but okay, I, I was yeah. I, I'm trying my best. Yeah, um, you we're you're, trying to find something nice. And mind you. You know, it's a squeaky wheel. Most of the players were very nice. 
you know, most, most players, most people like to be liked. They don't want to be, be assholes. And, you know, some, I'm, you know, the the bad people are getting a lot of press, but the the good people are the ones that kept the industry going while, while dealers were getting abused and not coming back. Yeah. And and it doesn't take that high of a percentage of bad people to really make, make the experience quite miserable. Absolutely. Um, It only takes one dickhead in a game to change the whole like you can have a game everybody's kind of you know laughing and giggling and playing poker and just talking to their neighbor and then somebody will sit down and drunk or just someone who we know is an asshole and he can just ruin the whole game in about one orbit with yeah. with negativity for and, sure you know it's it's hard to to be in a good mood all the time when you're playing poker i mean it's a highly charged game it's a very emotional game that we're all playing and, you know, I don't expect people to act like they'd be in church, but, you know, <laughs> you know, with, yeah, I like the mail analogy that when, you know, the way players throw cards at the dealers, when the mailman brings you the power bill and the water bill, do you say, ah, oh, bills and throw them back in his face? No, he's just delivering the mail and that's all the dealer's doing. Well, it, it shows, well, I, I guess what's most surprising to me is the abuse from the high stakes players and the people that really ought to know better. Yes. that dealers have no dealers are not in charge of right. the runouts they're not in charge of the cards that are dealt this is right. a game of of randomness and what you're doing is just putting the responsibility for some outcome onto something or someone else mm-hmm. when the reality is like you're supposed to take responsibility mm-hmm. and wear your big boy pants and accept right. that what happened and you don't have to smile about it right. you don't have to be happy but accept responsibility because yeah. i mean it, yeah it's just like it, it just seems like such a no-brainer that mm-hmm. like you're not in charge of unless of course you are right <laughs> i guess that's yeah. a different situation <laughs> if it if you're getting cheated in some sort of some sort of private game or even a public game then I, that's like different but i mean yeah it's it, it boggles my mind that players who are world class think about the game at a high level could also devolve into blaming someone who's just totally not responsible. And, you know, so I wonder so much over the years, do these players actually believe some of the things that they say? You know, like, I can't, you give me that card every time. Well, of course, that's observation bias. I don't give you that card every time. Because if I could give you that card every time, I would. I give you that <laughs> piece of clothes up and make you open every single hand. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's, uh, Yeah. Um, oh, Barry Greenstein, there's another really good guy at the table. <laughs> just, that, that makes sense. The, the, the Robin Hood of poker. That, yeah. That makes sense. Um, I think. And, and of course, Mike Sexton and, and Chip Reese and Danny Robinson, they've all, they're all not with us anymore, but uh, they were, they were a trio of fine men who behaved and who played the games well. And they were always gentlemen, always gentlemen. Did you find uh, people stand up? to the, the bullies and the shitheads? The other customers? Yeah. Uh, once in a while, usually everyone kind of is looking out the window when, when the dealer's getting abused because people don't want to step in it. Or the guy who's giving the dealer a hard time is the live one and they don't want him to get run off. Mm-hmm. And once in a while, before the dealer or before I would have a chance to say something, someone who threw cards or whatever, I've had a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of, uh, a lot of situations where a player in the game will say, hey, don't throw the card to her or don't talk to her that way or, you know, stop saying the F word or whatever. You, you will get players. That's more so in the lower limit games because people are just wanting to have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, once you get probably to a, you know, two five game and bigger, you, you get people who don't want to have fun. They just want to play poker. And now that we're all playing no limit as opposed to stud and, and other games we played back then, with no limit, it, you have to pay more attention because it's really important to see what the other people are doing so that you get a line on their play. In a, in a limit game, it's not so much the case. It's, you know, you definitely need to pay attention, but it's not, it, it's not a, a quiet game like No Limit can usually be. You survived pre-flop boot camp. You've shot the fish in a barrel. Now, prepare yourself for the feeding frenzy. A comprehensive strategy for gutting every fish in your player pool. Data-driven hero bluffs, light call-downs, 
and perfect value bets that are maximally designed to hurt some feelings. Feeding Frenzy. Available now at ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash Feeding Frenzy. Unfortunately, I think that's the major regret that I have in my poker career is not standing up for the dealer or for other players in these situations when things kind of go to hell in a handbasket and right. somebody's getting abused. And well, it's it, not it's too a, late. No, no, I, I do the best that I can, you know, when I have the opportunity. Um, it's just, it's exactly what you said, though. A lot of times it's the live one, right? A lot mm -hmm. of times it's the live one who's ran up a stack yep. with a thousand big blinds and they're just going to give it away. They're going off like a rocket and nobody wants to rock the boat just, you know, because. And you know what, when I, in a situation like that, I can see what's going on with, with the other players when somebody's that live, but you know what? Then you guys better be tipping me because I'm not going to let this guy abuse me and, and not get on his case. Uh, you know, yeah, and I, I, I shame tip <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I, I've shame tipped in the past. Like, I'm I so like sorry. It. I'm so sorry you have to deal with this. I will give you extra money. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, but that's true. Cause I, I, you know, there'll be, there'll be a player who will flip the dealer 20 bucks and take, just let anything go at this table, you know? And as long as everybody is on board with it, I don't care. You know, I'm not, not going to let you reach over and grab somebody's chips, but I mean, as far as, uh, you know, the behavior, it's not a church, you know, I, I like it when the guys are having fun. You know? Tell me, tell me some of the good memories in Vegas during those days, some of the good stories, the fun times. Wow. Fun times. Well, here's an unusual story. I was working at the El Cortez, and this would have been in about 78, 79. And I, I think they still have the same carpet on the floor now as they had back then. But anyway, <laughs> oh, God. We, they had a, a social security number contest. And you, you'd come in every day and see if your numbers were in the same order or whatever. But you had a bazillion people in there with, with uh, uh, the social security cards. So we had a pretty thriving one free poker game most mornings because people would come in and check their numbers at nine in the morning. Well, they had this, we had this promotion in the poker room where for, for a straight flush or a royal flush, you got, I don't know, dinner at the prime rib room or something. And I'm getting ready to push a dealer out and he deals a royal flush. So now, you know, they got to do the paperwork and I'm standing there waiting to get in. This is a paperwork so he can get his $4.95 comp. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the only reason I even can tell the story is because I was there and I saw it. So now I finally they get done with the paperwork. The dealer brings his cards in. He claps out of the, out of the table, and I sit down. The very first hand I deal the same guy royal flush. <laughs> now, how crazy is that? <laughs> That's pretty crazy. You know, it, uh, two steak dinners for that gentleman. Yeah, there you go. But, <laughs> you know, I've been at tables where they'd be doing some proposition betting and stuff, and that's always fun because it's entertaining. Um, you know, and some days you'll just go into work and everybody will be nice. You know, or, or I, you know, I had some jobs along the way that were really, really good jobs. Um, the, the Hilton comes to mind. Back when I worked at the Hilton, uh, Tom Bowling was the card room manager. We had 16 tables and a 10-table 10, 10 alcove for tournaments. We had a 1530 uh, RAS game every single day, every single day. And there was nobody misbehaving because they knew they couldn't get away with it. But I was, deal I was dealing when I first started there, um, before I had a shift, I was just dealing on their uh, – uh, during their tournament and i was told that they had an absolutely zero abuse policy absolutely zero so i'm dealing there i'm doing one and two hundred sky data better and johnny moss who everybody's heard of uh, he's he's in the eight seat and i'm dealing the cards he loses the pot and he starts muttering at me and that was what johnny moss would do he would just mutter well i couldn't stand it because i wanted to find out if i wanted to live here so i looked at him i said excuse me mr moss you're playing at the Las Vegas Hilton tonight. And he shut up. <laughs> he shut up. And I decided then, oh, I want to go to work there. And it was, it was a, it was a really good job. They, they took good care of the employees for, for meals and stuff and uniforms. It was just good. I, you know, I had a lot of, I met a lot of people along the way where I'd get involved with them doing charity work and, and stuff. Poker players are amazingly friendly and um, giving uh, it's not just all a, a you know a, a war on the table. Absolutely, that's been my experience as well. And I think for poker managers um, that are might listen to this show, I would say that 
what you're talking about right there is how a process can solve the problem, right? Like mm-hmm. the process at, it was the Hilton, right? Yes. The process at the Hilton kept uh, the dealer safe from abuse, created a good environment. Mm-hmm. And that's just how it should be. Like if you have bad actors, you have bad characters, yeah. um, improve your process. This is something that I, I talk about in online poker because there's lots of shady things that people can do to gain an mm-hmm. edge. Like yeah. always just play your small blind if you're playing heads up and then leave directly after you play your small blind, things like that. And, you know, seating scripts, it's another thing where a, you know, a fish joins a table and then the wait list is 80 people deep just automatically. Uh, and the reality is like, Websites should take accountability and platforms mm-hmm. should take accountability to improving their own processes so that people can't do stuff like that. Yeah, they shouldn't be allowed. They should figure it's a flaw and fix it. Exactly. Right. Instead of like banning people, calling out bad actors, saying, telling people not to do it, just fix your damn software and make it make better sure to play on. It. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like if they can't do it, they can't do it. Exactly. Um, you don't do it. <laughs> Right. And, and I think that that's just like, you, you want to eliminate that aspect of things, fix the process, fix the mm-hmm. loopholes, see the system that's in place here that is either allowing or not allowing a certain behavior you don't want and just right. up, upgrade it. Yeah. What's an unexpected thing that's come in your poker journey? Oh, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure that this answers that question, but it's kind of a similar question that I never thought that I would be as happy and well grounded and situated at this point in my life as I am. And that's because along the way, it doesn't matter all these bad stories I'm telling you about all these assholes. Most of the people I've met along the way have been wonderful people. And all my best friends here in town, all the people I spend lots of time with, they're all poker players. I'm, I know all of them through poker one way or the other. And I think that you know, probably one of the coolest things along my journey is just that I've met so many amazing people, you know, because I can understand like a blackjack dealer probably goes to work, deals blackjack and goes home and they, they don't even know blackjack players, whereas poker is more of a social thing and you're playing against the players and not that and not the house so that, you know, there is much more conversation. But yeah, I've just, I've been incredibly fortunate to, to hitch my, my uh, cart up to some good wagons. Um. You mentioned, you know, that, that it's unexpected that you're, you'd be so grounded because of all the things that you experienced. I would say, could you talk about either people that you observed who were going through a, an exceptionally bad time because of this behavior? And the reason that I ask is just because I want to, I, I want the listener to understand the consequences of acting shitty, treating people poorly, the downstream effects psychologically that, you know, they may not think about in the heat of battle or the heat of the moment. I don't know if this answers that question, but I mean, I've seen a lot of players over the years just ruin their lives, just absolutely ruin their lives because they don't know when to say when. Um, And that was a, that was an example with, uh, with Stu Unger. Um, He was a, he was brilliant. He was a gifted guy. I mean, he, you know, he could play gin and know every card in the deck. I mean, it was just, it's crazy. And he was gifted at poker, but he just couldn't get out of his own way. And I've seen, I've seen that kind of behavior ruin so many people who otherwise would, would have, you know, have, have the world by the tail. Uh, you have any, any Stu Unger stories? Well, um, yeah, I mean, these are just things that I heard along the way, but I know that back in the early 80s, uh, he had a room at the 17th floor at the Dunes, which is where Bellagio is now. And he was a huge uh, sports better, huge sports better. He was also a degenerate. So he'd bet these huge amounts of money on sports. And then he'd go up to the 17th floor and watch his TV. When his team be losing, he'd throw the TV out the window. I mean, literally, now mind you, this is probably only a 17-inch Sony Trinitron or something. But, you know, didn't they weigh about 800 pounds? And he would throw it out of the 17th floor window and then he'd call down and he'd say, nope, I need another TV. Mine's not working. And they'd bring <laughs> it to him. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't, um, you know, it's funny with, with Stewie because I'm, I'm real good friends with Nolan Dalla who wrote the book on Stewie. And, and I, I was very, very close friends with, with Mike Sexton who also, you know, had Stewie under their wings. And, and to hear, to hear them talk about Stewie, it's like 
they're talking about an entirely different person than the Stewie I knew because they're all seeing the good in him. They aren't seeing how re, how just horrible he was at, to dealers and to players. Um, oh, but that that reminds me. And this I don't even know who did this, but it's something I actually saw. It's pretty unusual. Um, back in the eighties, probably it was. Um, a guy took a cocaine vial and put it on the, the leather rail, cut it out, snorted it, put it back in his thing, and not one person said anything. No one, you know, I mean, it was it was bizarre. It's like, well, that, you know, that's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I guess he was the live one at the time. They didn't throw him out. But, yeah, oh, God, there's been, there's been a lot of crazy things over over the years. Yeah, I've heard similar stories about, you know, Stewie's bad behavior towards dealers oh. and Terrible. just, yeah. And also you hear the flip side of it too, right? You hear the good of winning three WSOPs and, mm-hmm. you know, him and Mike Sexton were, were very good friends and, you know, it just, uh, it's a, it's a sad story. And yeah, Mike, Mike always stood up for, for Stewie and, you know, that was something, that was something that Mike and I just never were going to agree on. And I realized that his, he was friends with Stewie and, and he was trying to help him. Whereas I was just, a, you know, a dealer that was, you know, uh, interchangeable. But yeah, that, there's a lot. There can be a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol and poker. But I, I don't, I don't think that that's as bad as it used to be. You know, I think that people are in a healthier place these days. Well, yeah, I think poker's evolved a lot yeah. since then, and especially the people that play at the highest levels recognize that. Oh, I don't want to have a clouded mind while I'm right. playing yeah. for hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's probably not beneficial to, to my poker career to be operating at a low level cognitively. Yeah. You know, playing the three, three and $6,000 limit poker when I'm shit faced, probably not such a good idea. Yeah. Pro- probably not so good, especially when you're playing against, you know, the crushers of yeah. today where it, you know, it doesn't matter like how much natural talent you have. Um, everybody at that level is talented and Mm -hmm. performance is what separates uh, the winners from the losers. And if your performance is low, then you're just done. You're toast. Yep. So I know you and Linda had business ventures together, or maybe you still do. Mm -hmm. How'd you tell me about that? Getting into business with Linda? Well, um, as I say, when she bought the magazine, which, which had the, the cruises at the time, I was already working for the cruises. And because we were friends, you know, it was a continuation of, of employment for me. And then through being uh, through working on the cruises, uh, she got to know me better. I got to know her better. And she saw that I was capable of pretty much doing any job in the poker room. And so she was like, well, have at it. And so that and then I was I had the opportunity to buy a piece when there was a change in ownership and whatnot. And the ownership of, of Car Player Cruises has changed a lot over the years. I have owned a piece of it, I think, since right around 2000, I guess. Um, and then, and anyway, so there were, there were four, four owners and then there were three, then there was four, then there was just two when, when Linda and I were the, were the sole owners. And as recently as, I guess it's been five or six years, I don't even know, uh, Mark and Tina Napolitano are now the majority owners of Card Player Cruises. Uh, Linda and I have uh, have just a, a piece to keep us interested, but it's the cruises, and the cruises are our baby. So that, that we will always find them interesting. We will always want to be involved in that. Tell me about the experience of going on a cruise because I I don't think so. I actually I was going to say I don't think I've ever been on a cruise, but that is not true because I started out my poker career on cruises to nowhere off Cape Canaveral in Florida. Oh sure, uh, um, the where you know, uh, it was, oh my God, what was the name of the, oh, the sea escape sun, sun cruise? It was sun cruise. Sun, sun cruise. cruise. Yeah. 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 Um, and they had the real low ceiling in there and it was smoky. Terrible. Yeah. I can't even remember what's that. Yeah. That's it's like my memory. This was 17 years ago or so. I just remember it was amazing. <laughs> that was all yeah. I remember. It was like, cruises are amazing. Oh my, oh, I was the poker. It was a poker. The cruises, uh, the cruises were questionable for me because I get motion sickness. Oh, no, no, it's not for you. Yeah, the first, um, my first memory, the first big pot that I won, I've told this story on the podcast before, but I was sitting there, I had aces, I was playing 4-8 limit, which is tons of $1 chips. Mm -hmm. So many white chips. And I'm just like, I can't remember the board, I'm just like ramming and jamming every single street 
just like a maniac out of control. <laughs> and I win this pot. It's one of those pots that like the dealer has to shove twice to get you all the right. chips. And I, I'm just like looking out the porthole going up and down. And I realize like, oh, something's wrong. <laughs> Something is not right. And you needed to close your eyes right then. Don't look at the horizon. Oh God. I ran out and spewed all oh. over. Like from <laughs> the second deck on the canopy below, it was oh, nice. it was horrible. Um and that was when I learned about Dramamine and, and Bonine. <laughs> the drama mean was okay. I, I didn't, they sold the drama mean in those little 50 mm -hmm. cent, uh, things. You just put 50 cents in, get right. your two, two drama mean out, take one. Um, I was okay after that. Sometimes I, I got a little sleepy, um, <laughs> on the boat, yeah. but other than that, the drama mean kept me in line. Well, those, those, the cruises to nowhere were, you know, were really good for, for getting more players interested in the game. I, I was up on some of those down in Fort Lauderdale and, you know, I'm like, man, these people must just be hard up to play poker because it was just so mediocre poker on the ship, on the boat. And it was smoking out was years and years ago. I was there, but had very low ceilings. Everybody smoked. And I am an adamant non-smoker. I, I would, I'd rather never play poker again in my life than sit next to a smoker. Yeah, yeah it's, it's strange. I, I don't remember smoking or not smoking at all. And I, I think like when I was working at Applebee's, you know, it's, Funny how quickly the world changes. I was 18 years old, and back then there was smoking and non-smoking, you know, and it was separated by just like 15 feet, one Stanton. section. Yeah, it's like one session. One section is smoking, the other is non-smoking, yeah, and don't don't pee in that end of the pool either. I mean, that's exactly. Um, so smoking, yeah. What I didn't even I wasn't even thinking about it. My my dad smoked. My mom smoked. My stepdad smoked. My wow. grand all my grandparents smoked. Basically, my friends smoked. So I didn't. You know, I had no even thought. It, it was just wow. like a natural part of my existence. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody in my family smoked. Ugh. Yeah. I, I I shudder to think of how many secondhand cigarettes I smoked as a kid. Yeah. Like thousands, I'm sure. Yeah. Um. So the cruises, oh, going back to the cruises, the experience of these cruises, the card player cruises, how long do they typically last? What are the excursions like? Like, what's the experience? Like, because like I said, I, I haven't ever been on, especially a multi-day cruise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, the, the cruises that we take, they're, the majority of them are seven-day cruises. We do do some longer cruises, some eight, some 10, some two-week cruises. Um, and those are mostly exotics, which means we are leaving not from the United States. Uh, but let me just give you a, a, a Caribbean cruise. I'll tell you how that, how that would work. So everybody flies to Fort Lauderdale. We get on a ship. And then the, the evening that we're on the ship, we have a welcome aboard party for, the, for all of our guests. You have to book with us to play in the poker room. And you have to book with us to come to our parties and things. Um, so we have a, a cocktail party and give everybody the the rules because our poker room is a little bit different you know because we're on on the ship um but you have the poker room it's open anytime the ship is i'll say anytime the ship is moving that's a little not quite 100 percent true but for the most part if we're if we are sailing this the card room is open if we're in port it is closed which which means because people are like well i won't ever have time to do anything when i'm because i'm playing poker the, the card room is closed uh, so you'll go to every port, you'll see everything you want to see. We always do some private excursions. We usually have a bus tour one day in one of the ports and maybe a, a, a something that goes out on a yacht another time. And these are all things that, that our, our guests can buy from us. Um, they always sell out. So it's first come, first serve usually because we can't, we can't have enough space for everybody because we don't know what everybody wants to do. But um, yeah, it, uh, the, and then you come back, you shower up, you go have dinner, you play poker in the evening. We also do some some of the big events. We we had the Party Poker Million, the original one. And uh, we actually did it four, four times. We did three charters with four of those tournaments. And, you know, we do, um, we do, we've done, uh, uh, oh, God, what's, it, what's the name? Oh, my God. Uh, the ones from the, the Midwest who just. Uh, the. Midstakes Poker Tour, is that it? No. Uh, oh, the Heartland. We, uh, Heartland Poker a, Tour. had to deal with the Heartland Poker Tour. We, we've done it where we've done some special events for people on the cruises. Um, and you you come back, You maybe there's a show that night you want to take your wife or your partner to. Um, you know, you want to make them happy too, so you can't be playing poker all the time. But 
there's so much for the non-playing partner to do on the cruise ship. Everything is open. There's, you know, there's games every day. There's enrichment lectures. Uh, and then Linda and Johnson, Linda Johnson and I, on the first sea day, which is usually the first day after the first sleep, we give uh, limit hold'em lessons. And these are very basic, very like, this is the button, this is a blind, this is a card, you know, this is a chip. I mean, it's pretty darn basic, but we teach a whole lot of players how to play. And then they'll play a two, four or three, six game for the rest of the week. And I always call it the check and giggle game <laughs> because they don't want I don't want to bet you because I, you know, you're my friend. I mean, they literally won't bet each other because they've all gotten to know each other. And it's so cute. And you, there's more <laughs> laughter coming from that table. And, and we love our beginners. We love it. But we, we've also done some boot camps on the cruise. Um, there's just about anything you can think of you can make happen on a cruise. And, and we, we made it all happen. But, you <laughs> yeah. know, I mean, we've, we've done hundreds and hundreds of cruises. I yeah, mean, we, I've probably cruised several years of my life. When when you, when y'all's next cruise firing up? Uh, November 3rd, 2nd, 3rd, 7th, 7th, November 7th or 8th. Because we're going the week early, but I have three cruises between now and then. Wow, um, I, that's a lot of cruising. Have, we have a, a wonderful friend. Uh, her name is Diane, and she's she's an older woman, and she's legally blind. And we take her everywhere with us. And she lives in Florida, and so we're taking her on these cruises before the poker cruise because we're trying to get her more points so she can be a pinnacle, which is the you know it's like a. a the rapid reward program, something like that. Because mm -hmm. pinnacle, once you're a pinnacle, you get everything that you can possibly get. So we're 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 trying to help her get there. Juicing up her cruise game. That's right. She, well, she would have been a pinnacle already, but for the pandemic, you know, we we canceled 18 cruises. 18. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, and that's a lot of airfare to, to roll back and end up with credits and things. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's been a crazy, crazy year and a half. Oh, uh, hasn't it? Crazy year and a half. And yet it's gone fast. It has. It, I think what's interesting about my life experience. Uh, there's and you're a very young. A quote. <laughs> well, some days I feel like that and some days I don't. <laughs> um, I, I never actually thought so. I, I've been a professional poker player for 17 years and I never thought I would be anything for 17 years. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm coming up on two decades. Like, wow, that just feels incredible to me. Um, but but I sometimes, most of the time, I, I think mm -hmm. what's interesting is the transition that I've made in a podcasting into creating courses, into coaching, into training. Mm -hmm. Um, has really given new life to my poker career, helping, nice. helping people is just something that I'm very passionite about and figuring and out how. Isn't it nice instead of take, take, take to give something back? Because as poker players, we're trying to beat each other's brains out. You know, sure. we're trying to take, take, take. And so, yeah, we're, we do a ton of, of giving back and it, yeah, it makes, I, I'm a little selfish when I do it because I, I do it for me. Yeah. I mean, but that's okay. Is, yeah. They get fed. So. Exactly. That that's okay. And, and this is something that you know. It's a point that I've made multiple times on the show, but I'll I'll make it again because it matters to me. Right. And that that's that. It, it's that you can take people's money at the poker table. You can make a living playing poker. That doesn't mean you can't give back in other ways. Right, that doesn't absolutely. mean that your hands are tied behind your back and you can't give back to society and help in other ways. Right. Yep. You and, can check raise check raise them at the table and buy them dinner afterwards. Right. You you can. There are lots of ways to give back to yes, society. There are. And, you know, you, you, you may not make a living doing it, but you can still do it. There's nothing yeah. stopping you. That's right. And it's, you know, it's the gift that makes you feel better. Exactly. Um, all right. So when you think about joy in your career dealing and playing cards, what's the first memory that comes to mind? Wow. <laughs> the first memory. I'm trying to give any memory. I mean, joy, of course, um, you know, I, I felt very joyous when I was, uh, when I was inducted into the Women in Poker Hall of Fame. That, I mean, I guess that's more pride than joy, but I, you know, that was kind of joyful. I, I, wow. I guess all, all the people I've met through teaching poker and working, you know, being a poker dealer and being around poker, um, I've just, I've met so many wonderful people. When I think about the wonderful people I've met, it makes me very joyous because I think that poker players, you know, for people who don't know us, we get a bad rap. 
but poker players who have been my entire circle of friends for the last, you know, generation and a half, you know, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in my experience, they're family and I do anything for them. And I believe they would do anything for me too. And I think that's, it, poker is a game that it's not a total requirement, but you do need, like, you need a high level of empathy for your fellow man to understand how people think, how people feel. And I think that the best poker players, a lot of times, the successful ones have, you know, that that's not just specific to poker. It's also, they use it in life as well. And mm -hmm. Like you said before, poker players tend to be exceptionally generous yep. um, with their time and their and on energy. honorable, honorable oh. as well. Yeah, poker. You know, yeah, they you can use everything you got at the poker table, but they're honorable people, and a handshake means a handshake. I mean, it, it your word is good. You have to have a high level of integrity yes. to make it in the long run in the poker world, because. I agree with that. When you don't have self responsibility and you don't have a high level of integrity, you're going to fall into one of the various traps that will break you. And that's something that, yeah, I just fundamentally believe that the best poker players, you have to hold yourself responsible because if you don't, you will go broke. You will yep. burn your money in the strip club. You will drink yourself to death. You will yep. blow all your bankroll in the pit. Yep. Um, you, you'll you become an Who's outcast. In and, cars. <laughs> right. You, you um, borrow money from people that ruins your reputation and your credibility in the poker yep. world. Like just when you don't have integrity, you don't make it in this world. And the people that do make it for a long time, I'm just, I feel very blessed to be able to call them my friends. Yeah, no, it's, it, there are some amazing people in poker. More, way more good guys than bad guys. Way more. And with that said, let's, uh, we're going to hit the lightning round for a moment. <laughs> and um, then we'll, we'll part ways for now. Uh, All right. If you could wave a magic wand, and change one thing about poker, today's poker, what would it be? Ooh. Better training for employees. Which employees specifically? Everybody. Um, not, you know, dealers, but, but brush people and list people and cashiers. There, there, are, there are ways to do things. There are procedures in poker. And if they're done right, it's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, a lot of times they're not done right. And it's so it's much easier to teach an employee how to do something the right way to begin with than to try to change the behavior once they are doing it. If you could gift all poker players one book to read, what would you choose and why? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a book on poker. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I mean, <laughs> wow. Uh, wait a minute. I just read something recent. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what. Mike Sexton's autobiography, because that will teach you about the joy in poker and in life. Because he he was a joyous guy, and and his book is a happy book. And I it'd be nice if boy if if everybody could have Mike Sexton's attitude when they go into play poker, it would be a much nicer place. Yeah, I'm Mike Sexton. That book has been recommended five or six times by by guests on this show. I believe it, it's Life's a Gamble, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's funny because we we found a few mistakes in the book, but you know it was my story to tell. So <laughs> we uh, on the very first year of the the party poker million it was a million dollar guarantee. Mm -hmm. Well, ten thousand dollar buy in. We only got sixty players, mm -hmm. so we had about four hundred thousand reasons why this was going to suck to be us. Well, yeah. in the book, when we were reading the book, Mike said that because we'd done this in conjunction with party poker, he said that party poker paid for it. I'm like, no, Mike, they didn't pay for it. Card Player Cruises paid the whole 400000 and we were almost out of business that week. And yep. Linda, like, told, you know Linda, Linda told me the same exact story, yeah. Yeah, and everybody knew then that we had integrity That because, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, houses would have put a whole bunch of people in the tournament because it would have been free rolls for those, those additional 40 spots since sure. we had to pay the money anyway. Um, but, yeah. It's, <laughs> um, Why didn't you yeah. do that? Sorry? Why didn't you do that? <laughs> yeah, why, why didn't we? That, <laughs> that seems like a good idea, actually. Yeah. Just, uh, stake, you know stake 40 people. There are a lot of people who would see nothing wrong with that. 
And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a real line as to how somebody believes on what's fair and what's not here. Because that's, that's not even close. I mean, how can you even think that that's fair? But they're like, well, you got to pay it anyway. Yeah, well, let's just cheat our customers out of the overlay, you know, an overlay you take advantage of. Yep. And that sounds like a juicy tournament. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, not so juicy for y'all. No, uh, no, not juicy, so juicy for the players, though. But it, I think it's what really helped launch us as far as, you know, being, you know, where people could know they could cruise with us and that we were, we would do what we said, that we said. And, uh, you know, and then just the whole thing, the whole thing with Party Poker, that was fun doing that. And um, that was a limit tournament that, that year, the first year. Yeah, Kathy Liebert took it down, yep. I believe, yep. right? Um, here's a, a question I just came up with off the top of my head. Is there anything from the old days that you would bring back to modern day poker? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, there used to be a position in a, in a card room for a person who was called the brush person. And what this person would do is they would kind of walk up and down the aisle that separated the poker room from the casino. And anytime anybody would come up and kind of look like they might be interested, the brush person would go and say, hi, you know, have you played poker before? Can I answer any questions for you? Would you like to give it a try? You know, et cetera, et cetera. That, that job has not been staffed for probably 30 years, and it was probably the most important employee. If I, if I was going to open up a card room, that's the first person I would hire because they brush people in. And it's very intimidating to play poker the first time or the second time or, you know, when you haven't played for six months, because it is intimidating. If you have that brush, brush person to break that for you, um, it helps get new players in the game. Getting new players in the game is what it's all about. You know, it's, e it's easy to keep players. You yeah, know, it's, cool. it's a salesperson, right? Like that's, yep. that's what they are. They're a roaming mm -hmm. salesperson. When you're in a store and kind of overwhelmed, they show you where things are and yep. show you how to navigate. That, that is actually it's kind of crazy to me that there isn't that person anymore. Yeah. And I, you know, there, there are card rooms in town where I'm kind of intimidated to go in them because I don't know the layout of the, and it would just be so much nicer if they, you know, some, some employee would greet you when you come in the card room. And I, I just think that that host position is, is sorely missing. Yeah. I mean, the front desk people, um, <laughs> not yeah. so inviting in the card room. Like, hey, no. what, do you, what do you want? <laughs> like, yeah. What do you or mean? I, what do you mean? What do I want? I'm wanna... talking behind the, the big tall, you know, stand and you can't even get their attention. So, yeah. yeah, that's okay. now that I think about it, that's that's kind of shitty, just yeah. shitty customer service. Yep. Are you working on any projects right now that are near and dear to your heart? No, I'm, I'm really not. I mean, I, as as Christmas gets closer, I just as holidays get closer, you know, we'll be we'll be doing some sort of charity component feeding the homeless, or which is a thing we do every Monday night. But at Christmas, we usually find an organization and, and uh, adopt some kids and then get getting their wish list so that, you know, maybe back, maybe we can get Billy that bicycle and maybe we can get her the Barbie doll and, you know, something they asked for. And, you know, that's so that kind of stuff is probably the biggest thing I have on the on the uh, docket right now. Um, you know, as, I mean, there's always opportunities to to do the right thing, and we just we know at the holiday times there's some kids, there's Monday nights we uh, we feed the homeless down in in North Las Vegas, and this uh, day before yesterday when we were down there, there were kids coming through the line, children, and it was just, you know, and we're out there. It was so windy that was the night. It was just insanely windy, and you know we'd be out there and. As soon as you think, oh, it's so cold, it's so windy, I want to go in, you got to realize that these people are out there all the time. Mm. But you can't go, oh, it's too hot, I don't want to go. Oh, it's too cold, I don't want to go. Oh, it's windy, I don't want to go. And it sometimes when the weather's bad, I think it actually means more to the helpers because they realize that these folks are, are out here all the time. But those are the kind of projects I've got going. Yeah. And if a podcast listener wants to give, what is the URL that they can oh. visit? Uh, pokergives.org, P-O-K-E-R-G-I-V-E-S.org. And that's, an, that's a, a, a charity organization that, that Linda Johnson, Mike Sexton, Lisa Tenner, and I uh, founded, I, I don't even know what, 15 years ago probably. Right now it is being administered by Lupe Soto from Lip, the Lips Tour. And they, they, 
they do this, they're the ones who fund this Monday night dinner, and it's unbelievable that they've got, like, uh, for example, I made eight boxes of pasta for this last week for spaghetti, but because uh, Olive Garden donated bags and bags of meat sauce, frozen meat sauce. So it was fantastic. I mean, they, you know, you just pour it on the noodles we already cooked, but with, there's a lot of organizations and different companies that are happy to send us stuff all the time. Pokergives.org. If you're listening to this show and, and want to give back a uh, very worthy project. Thank you. Um, and final question for you, Jan, if the chasing poker greatness listener wants to learn more about you on the World Wide web, where can they go? Wow. Um, well, uh, I have a, 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 a page on cardplayercruises.com where I, there's kind of a bio. Um, uh, you, you could write, they could write to me, janetcardplayercruises.com, or they could write to my personal address, pokerfish at gmail.com. <laughs> but I love getting emails. I love hearing from people. Uh, you know, I'll probably, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, yeah. <laughs> Jan, th- thank you for your time and your energy and for you, both you and Linda, paving the way to clean up the game make it a safer space for more people. And yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful and appreciative for the work that y'all put in that has made my experience as a poker player better. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Brad, you're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking. It's like old friends hanging out. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.